Hello everyone. This is day one of Unit 2. Unit 2 is entitled Revolutionary Ideas, and day one of Revolutionary Ideas is the Protestant Reformation. A little introductory information before we start our summaries. This guy is Martin Luther. He, in, 19, in 1517, published 95 reasons that the Catholic Church was wrong. He asked questions. Uh, and the main question he asked was, what if people read the Bible themselves rather than letting the church tell them what to believe? You may remember Martin Luther from your studies in seventh grade, and I hope you do because that's almost all we have time for to talk about him today. So one question many of you asked me during the last unit when we studied Spanish and Portuguese actions in the New World was, what was the rest of the Europeans doing? What were the nations of continental Europe doing while Spain and Portugal conquered the Americas? And what they were doing was fighting over religion. Europe, as we know from Unit 1, was a uniquely violent place. And uh, also, it developed the use of firearms much faster than the rest of the world, it's even Asia, where firearms were originated. Some countries became Protestant after 1526, and others did not. The Catholic Church declared the Counter-Reformation in 1545, meaning to counter the Reformation, the Catholics were going to reform back at them. So these Protestant, protest Protestant groups that were protesting against the Catholic Church and wanted to reform the Christian religion fought wars against the Catholic Church and its counter-reformation. So this is Christians fighting Christians over what kind of Christianity is the right kind of Christianity to believe. They fought dozens or even hundreds of wars, depending on how you measure. Between 1565 and 1595, there were no fewer than eight separate wars within France. Between 1618 and 1648, there was a giant conflict called the Thirty Years' War in Central Europe. And that's what's illustrated here on this map. In this area of Central Europe, uh, some areas became Protestant and some areas remained Catholic and they fought each other in 30 years of incredibly brutal and violent warfare. One reason that the wars were so brutal was that you can't just take over land and declare winning or declare victory um, because the, the point of the war was to convince the population to change their religion. And so this means that the wars of conquest involved a great deal of what you see here, which is torture, and then uh, for unrepentant captives, a great deal of execution, which is what you see up here. The wars became increasingly violent over time. You have the invention of the professional military in this time period, um, the elaborate use of muskets, the development of cavalry, field glasses, maps, and offensive strategies were all new in this war. And each country used professional paid soldiers and even mercenaries. The other question people asked was what was happening with the British Isles? And what was happening is there was a war about religion and politics. It's kind of like the Thirty Years War, but inside of Britain between different people in the British Isles, between the Scots and the Brits, uh, Scots and the English, the English and themselves, the parliament and the nobles, every which way you could possibly imagine. Uh, this time period is generally called the English Civil War, 1642 to 1660 inclusive for this class's purposes. And the Catholic King here and his um, uh, Catholic uh, knights, so to speak, fought against the Protestant rest of the people. Sometimes these were called roundheads, their, their helmets and their short haircuts, um, giving them their name. And they fought over political power, but also over religion. The use of cavalry was at its height at this time, and uh, gentlemen, nobles like King Charles, but also like many of his nobles, um, they trained in the art of manege, 
Um, and there's an excellent documentary, which we don't have time to watch today. Um, but it's basically the art, it's developed into the art of horse dancing. And it's the art of managing, that word comes from manage, managing your horse and getting them to leap and jump and turn and, uh, and to do exactly what you tell them to in the midst of a cavalry battle. Cavalry are these men on horses in a battle, and to fight off the cavalry, the other side would use pike men, and pikes are these big long poles, kind of like long spears, but you don't throw them, instead you brace them on the ground, and then when the horses come running up, the horses either get stabbed, or if they're a smart horse, they turn around and run away. Then the cavalry adopted um, pistols, and so then, as a, as a response to that, the other side used muskets. And the early muskets here had a very long barrel for accuracy, but that meant it was too heavy to hold up. So they have these little kickstands, these little props to hold them up. This is the beginning of the use of guns and firearms in war. It's incredibly violent. And this is why, in large part, the British did not colonize very many places until after the 1660s. They were a little bit busy. Oh, side note, uh, at the end of all of this, King Charles loses and he is beheaded and there he is unceremoniously, well, very ceremoniously, but he's laying on the ground there and chop his head off. Next question, how is the printing press responsible for spreading the ideas of the Reformation? The Reformation, remember, is the protest protestant, protesting against Catholic reformation to reform the Christian religions. So how do you spread the ideas of the reform? Well, you use a printing press. And this is like a giant stamp, more or less. And you can make the stamp say whatever you want. So you have all these little metal things and you make them into little letters and you put them in order like this. And then you put them in a big grid and then you use it like a giant stamp and this person's putting ink on it and then they put paper on it and then they stamp it and then you can print hundreds and hundreds of copies of all kinds of things at first mostly copies of the bible and later newspapers flyers posters any number of things how is this responsible for spreading the ideas of the reformation well information spread and that spreads the idea of the reformation but most importantly it spreads the number of Bibles available in Europe. The price of printed books falls by about 80% in this time period, from somewhere around 53 shillings for a hand-copied book to somewhere around 11 shillings for a printed book. This also increases literacy, and the increase in literacy mm -hmm. increases people's education and ability to question and reason, which also encourages the Reformation. Next question, how did Protestantism start new branches of Christianity? Well, originally, the early Christian church had control over everyone in Europe. Everyone in Europe, basically, was Christian or they were Muslim or Jewish. But then, this Roman Catholic Church, headed by the, the Pope, was protested by Martin Luther, and he created a new kind of Christianity, Protestantism. But here's the thing. As soon as you create one new Protestant religion, someone else is going to start another Protestant religion. So Martin Luther says, we don't have to do it the Roman Catholic way. We're going to do Christianity our way, and that was called Lutheranism. But very soon, after and almost simultaneous to that, uh, Calvin is making his own version of Protestantism, and then the Anabaptists are making their version, and the Baptists are making their version, and later on the, the Evangelicals are going to make their version, and the Anglicans. And so basically, we had this tidy Catholic Church where everyone believed the same version of Christianity, and once Martin Luther asked some questions to protest against their control of belief, he protested, and lots of other groups protested in their own special ways. If you can make your own opinions about the Bible, read it yourself and decide what to do and when to pray and how to do it, you don't need priests to tell you what and how to believe, and so you can organize your own church. So this explains what happens and why, even today, 
there are so many different versions of Christianity, and there's only one version of Catholicism. And there are people today who are each of these religions. How did questioning Catholicism lead to scientific inquiry and empiricism? So the Protestant idea was to protest the concept that the priest knows everything and you get all knowledge from him. The Protestants said you read for yourself to figure out what you believe is true. So here's one of those Bibles. You are supposed to read it yourself and interpret it yourself. Here's one of those, here's a family, one person with a book reading it probably out loud to everyone else and everybody together can uh, think and discuss what they believe. The evidence in this case was thought to be better than what someone tells you. The evidence is the words in the Bible. And Protestantism asked people to not trust the priests, but instead to find out information for yourself, to be skeptical, to be curious. This leads to the development of scientific inquiry and empiricism. Almost all intellectuals in the 15 to 1600s worked in a religious spirit, i.e. Um, the scientists and the scientific community believed that God wrote effectively two books. He wrote the Bible through humans and he wrote the world, the natural world, all of the animals, all of the plants, the geography, the mountains, the seas, etc. So the natural world is a book that God created just like the Bible is, and we should study it just like we should study religion. Empiricism is a way of studying things yourself. Empirical evidence is evidence you have seen with your own eyes. You've experienced yourself firsthand. And so empiricism encourages people to go out and do experiments themselves. Don't just believe what the church told you, but then by extension, don't just believe what the experts told you or the teachers told you or the doctors told you. Go and do an experiment for yourself. And so questioning religion leads people to question many other things, and it actually eventually leads to the development of the scientific method. You should write your five summaries for each of these questions in the assignment that is posted online. And I will see you again tomorrow with the scientific revolution.